History as it happens, August 30th, 2022. Ayman al Zawahiri and the future of Al Qaeda. After years of tracking him, armed forces sent two missiles from a drone flying above the Afghan capital. Of the masterminds behind the September 11 terrorist attacks, he later succeeded Osama bin Laden as the leader. Al Zawahiri was killed in a U.S. drone strike in Kabul, ending a manhunt lasting more than two decades. Justice has been delivered, and this terrorist leader is no more. People around the world no longer needed to fear the vicious and determined killer. The United States continues to demonstrate our resolve and our capacity to defend the American people against those who seek to do us harm. The man who succeeded bin Laden has met the same fate, assassination by the long reach of the U.S. military. Ayman al-Zawahiri is dead, but the ideas that influenced him, the ideas underpinning global jihad, survive. A half century after a cleansing wave of Islamic fundamentalism began reshaping world history, and the global war on terrorism seems to have no end. That's next when we speak to Peter Bergen as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. There has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. We understand that a plane One report has crashed. As of yet into unconfirmed, that a plane has hit of the World Trade Center. The United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. I'm now the fourth United States president to preside over American troop presence in Afghanistan. Two Republicans, two Democrats. I will not pass this responsibility onto a fifth. I've concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. On August 1st, a little less than a year after American forces completed the pullout from Afghanistan that he had ordered, President Biden announced a U.S. drone found al-Qaeda's leader in downtown Kabul. According to the president, according to conventional wisdom, Ayman al-Zawahiri was an essential member of al-Qaeda during the critical years of the 1990s. He was deeply involved in the planning of 9-11. One of the most responsible for the attacks that murdered 2,977 people on American soil. For decades, he was the mastermind behind attacks against Americans, including the bombing of the USS Cole in 2000, which killed 17 American sailors and wounded dozens more. He played a key role a key role in the bombing of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. And when Peter Bergen heard the president, he said, wait a second. And when I heard that, I was like, none of that makes any sense. Peter Bergen is the director of the International Security and Future of War programs at New America. He is an expert on international terrorism and al-Qaeda. He was one of a handful of Western journalists to interview Osama bin Laden, a story we talked about when Peter appeared on the podcast last year to discuss his latest book, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden. If you want to listen to that conversation, search for Bergen wherever you find this podcast. You know, I hadn't thought much about Ayman al-Zawahiri lately. When I heard the news that he'd been killed in a drone strike, I said, oh yeah, that guy. There was no celebration outside the White House this time, nothing like what happened in 2011 when U.S. forces killed bin Laden in Pakistan. Zawahiri, or Zawari, his name is pronounced different ways it seems, had what you might call the typical jihadi resume. Influenced by the writings of Saeed Khatub in Egypt, he despised the secular dictatorship of Anwar Sadat. He was one of hundreds of Islamists arrested after Sadat was assassinated, and he was thrown in prison for three years in 1981, where he'd be tortured by Egyptian intelligence officers. After his release, like any aspiring holy warrior, Zawahiri traveled to, where else, Afghanistan, during the anti-Soviet jihad, and that is where he met bin Laden in 1986. As we mark one year since the U.S. ended its disastrous nation-building project in Afghanistan, a couple of things to consider. First, I want you to check out the Costs of War Project at Brown University. You can Google it to see the appalling toll of 20 years of war. And now also seems like a good time to take stock of the movement bin Laden and Zawahiri were part of. 
although they represented a particularly violent, fringe, small, and unsustainable faction. A wave of Islamic fundamentalism swept the Muslim world in the 1970s, leading to what journalist Steve Call described as clandestine, informal, transnational religious networks such as the Muslim Brotherhood reinforced the gathering strength of old-line religious parties. This was especially true on university campuses, where radical Islamic student wings competed for influence from Cairo to Amman to Kuala Lumpur. When Ayatollah Khomeini returned to Iran and forced the American-backed monarch, the Shah, to flee early in 1979, his fire-breathing triumph jolted these parties, the Islamic parties, and their youth wings, igniting campuses in fevered agitation. Khomeini's minority Shiite creed was anathema to many conservative Sunni Islamists, especially those in Saudi Arabia, but his audacious achievements inspired Muslims everywhere. And that is Steve Call in his remarkable book, Ghost Wars. So there is no question today that this force changed the course of history. It shaped Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, to name three. And its most militant form, al-Qaeda-style terrorism, provoked war with the United States and military interventions that catalyzed increasingly intense anti-American feelings and resistance. As we know today, it is possible to kill lots of terrorists. It is not possible to kill an idea. But ideas can be discredited by their subscribers as well as their detractors. So when we consider the legacies of men like bin Laden or Zawahiri or Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and what they hope to accomplish, if that is the right word, on this earth, we must remember how they're viewed not only in the eyes of Americans, but among their fellow Muslims who died by the thousands as a result of their indiscriminate ferocity and violent fanaticism. And we might also consider why regimes such as the Islamic Republic of Iran have endured, while Zawahiri's Egypt reverted to military dictatorship after the fall of Hosni Mubarak. Peter Bergen, welcome back. Thanks for having me on. So you interviewed bin Laden, but you never managed to catch up to Zawari. What a massive hole on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a good story there, which I think is sort of relates to some of the questions we're going to be talking about, which is Zawahiri was sort of down on his luck and he wanted to join the Chechen resistance to the Russians. And he and a couple of other people went to Chechnya, got arrested in Dagestan in 97 and spent six months in a Russian jail. They pretended they were businessmen who'd taken a wrong turning or something, and eventually the judge released them. But it gets to this point that while bin Laden was building up al-Qaeda beginning in 96 and going public with his calls for attacks against the United States, Zawahiri was in a Russian jail, sort of languishing and looking to resuscitate his career. And then he came back to Afghanistan after he got released from jail. And he was really kind of a penniless supplicant at that point. He had almost no followers. His organization was in tatters. He himself was not a particularly effective leader. Yeah, he had his own jihadist uh, group, right? He had something called the, the jihad group. Huh. But according to al-Qaeda insiders and people who knew both Zawahiri and bin Laden, he had a handful of followers. One of bin Laden's bodyguards, I think, said he had 10 followers Somebody who edited the Arab language newspaper for the Taliban said he had seven followers. But whether it was seven or ten, the fact is it was a very small group. And he was sort of a divisive guy. and People weren't tremendously excited about him as a leader. And so that gets to this question of how important was he to yeah. al-Qaeda? Because we heard from the president, Joe Biden, after Zawahiri was assassinated, killed in the drone strike, that he was instrumental in the planning of 9-11, that he'd been involved in the 98 embassy attacks and the involved in the USS Cole attack in 2000. And when I heard that, I was like, none of that makes any sense. I, so I wrote a piece about it for CNN about a day later, because in the course of reporting my new book, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, something solidified that I've been actually writing about for some period of time, which is this overestimation of Zawahiri and his role in the whole al-Qaeda enterprise and his whole influence on bin Laden. If you look at the record, uh, Zawahiri barely appears in any of the accounts of the planning and operational planning around 9-11. He also had no influence on bin Laden's big idea, which was let's attack the United States so that the Arab regimes in the Middle East will fall because the U.S. will pull out of the Middle East. It was a nutty idea, but it wasn't Zawahiri's idea with bin Laden. So yeah, he was more focused on the near enemy, Egypt and the other secular dictators. And really Egypt. Like he went 
joined a jihadist group when he was 15. He spent three years in prison as a result of the assassination of Anwar Sadat. They put 300 people in prison. So he was a peripheral figure in that. You know, that was his whole life. And, and bin Laden had a very different vision. And I think he used Zawahiri for window dressing, because if you go back to 98, Bin Laden had a, his first and only press conference, and it was himself and Mohammed Atef, also known as Abu Hafs, who was the real deputy commander of, of al-Qaeda, who was killed after 9-11 in the U.S. drone strike. And then it was Zawahiri was there. But Zawahiri was, they claimed they had a world Islamic front, and having Zawahiri as part of it gave additional credence that this, this was a really global movement. All 10 of uh, his followers. <laughs> and all 10 of his followers. So um, Zawahiri was also not a military guy. And whatever else bin Laden, bin Laden was somebody who actually fought pretty bravely on the front lines against the Soviets. Zawahiri was pretty absent from all that and wasn't seen as a military guy, wasn't really taken very seriously. And if you also, if you go back and you look at the, the founding documents of Al-Qaeda, there was a two or three day meeting where they kind of hammered out what Al-Qaeda was and why it was being founded. Zawahiri wasn't listed as one of the attendees. So I'm a, a fan of Lawrence Wright's work. and The Looming Tower. The Looming Tower, Pulitzer and I'm Prize also a, book. Yeah. A, a friend of Larry Wright's, and but I think that his take on what happened was very influential. But it wasn't it wasn't correct. A key part of the thesis is that Zawahiri was the brains behind Al Qaeda, mm, and that idea got taken up by a lot of people. And I myself, in my first book in 2001, fell into that idea. Part of it was because, you know, Zawahiri would always appear after 9-11 by bin Laden's side. And so there was this visual imprimatur that Zawahiri was this really important guy. Now, he did become the deputy leader of al-Qaeda and eventually the leader of al-Qaeda. So it's not that he was unimportant, but I just think bin Laden was his own man. It would be like saying Goebbels was essential to the final solution. Well, not really. Yeah, you know? no, I get your point. Well, in your book, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, your biography of bin Laden was superb. And you have a lengthy footnote on page 92 addressing this issue, that Zawahiri wasn't a major figure in al-Qaeda, or at least at this time was not a major figure, did not right. have a major role in planning the embassy bombings in 98, the USS Cole in 2000, etc. Let's return to the history in a little bit here. First, I'd like to ask you, Peter Bergen, what you thought of when you saw the news that they caught him with a drone in Kabul. Where do you think he was hiding? Well, we know where he was hiding. He was hiding in this, this area in downtown Kabul, which is full of so-called poppy mansions, rather gaudy mansions built by people who've made a lot of money in the drug trade and or corruption. You know, it's a mile away from the presidential palace. It's in downtown Kabul. According to U.S. officials who I spoke to, members of the Taliban, the Haqqani network specifically, were A, aware that he was there, and B, try to cover up the fact that he was there. They sort of went up to try to clean up the site after the attack, which is all really unsurprising. The U.N., in May, released a report saying that Siraj Akhani, who's the leader of the Akhani network, who's also the Minister of the Interior and in charge of all the intelligence apparatus in Afghanistan, he's arguably the most powerful person in the Taliban other than the Supreme Leader. According to the UN, he's part of al-Qaeda. So these guys have been in cahoots for a long time. And there's I mean, a lot of overlap kind of, between these groups. Yeah. yeah. I was a little surprised that he was in downtown Kabul. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, actually, I, was, I wanted to know, where did you think he was hiding versus where he actually was? Well, I was. mean, I presumed he was in Afghanistan because yeah. for the longest time he's been in Pakistan. But it, there are some dangers about being in Pakistan. A number of al-Qaeda leaders have either been killed by drone strikes or killed in U.S. special operations or, or arrested by the Pakistanis and handed over the CIA. So but I was confident he was in Afghanistan because that would be the only same place to be once the Taliban had taken over. Did Pakistan help with intelligence or use of airspace for the drone? And if true, why I is that important? I very much doubt it. There's two places the drone could have come from. One is it could have been launched from a ship in the Arabian Sea. Without Now, you're right, that would have to cross Pakistani airspace. The other direction, it would come from Qatar. It, it's a good question. I don't know. I, I, it's a really good question. Because <laughs> Pakistan's role in sponsoring the Taliban for decades has obviously been a sore subject for the United States. But there's a, there's a two-faced nature to the ISI, Pakistan's intelligence services, the directorate, right? Yeah. I mean, also, their control of the Taliban is not, you know, like a lot of proxy relationships, often the sponsor is not fully in control no, of the agent. Control. I had thought the drone strike would have been launched 
either from Qatar Air Base, and that would come in from the direction of Iran. Obviously, they wouldn't fly over Iran. Does it change anything, given what we've already discussed about Zawahiri's role in al-Qaeda? There's a whole academic literature on decapitation strikes and what effect they have, if any, on the organizations. And and often they don't really... I mean, look, a classic example of one of these backfiring is the United States killed Abu Musab al-Zakawi, the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, in 2006. Eight years later, it was ISIS. Al-Qaeda in Iraq morphed into ISIS. And under that, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, it took over population the size of Bulgaria, territory the size of the United Kingdom, launched very devastating terrorist attacks in Paris and Brussels and Ankara and in Turkey, inspired fairly significant attacks in Florida and California. So, I mean, Al-Qaeda in Iraq actually became much more lethal after Abu Musab al-Zakari was killed. Well, I would so, agree that you can't kill your way out of these situations. Yeah, I mean, I think the caveat I'd make, if you kill enough people who are in the middle management, this is the Sam McChrystal plan. We now know that there was, once McChrystal's biography came out, I think in 2014, I was suddenly a light bulb went off in my head because I was like, wow, we had a certain history of the Iraq war, but there was this parallel secret history we really were not aware of, which is the devastating impact that JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command, had on al-Qaeda in Iraq. You know, they went from like four raids a month to like 300 raids a month. And they took out so many of the leadership that over time, al-Qaeda in Iraq really did, by 2010, was sort of more or less out of business. And then it resuscitated itself after we pulled our troops out of Iraq. Then it took advantage of the Syrian civil war and then became ISIS. So, so I would say, generally speaking, if you take out an Osama bin Laden, I think it does have an effect. You know, even though Osama bin Laden wasn't that effective in 2011 compared to what he was in 2001, still had a pretty big psychological effect. They have never replaced, there's no bin Laden in the wings. True. Zawahiri did not have the same charisma as bin Laden based on your work, what I've read. Yeah, and it didn't, he didn't turn it around. How do you explain the muted response to this assassination versus the more celebratory mood when the U.S. killed bin Laden in 2011? Well, I think the American public has a pretty good sense of what's important. <laughs> All those kids from George Washington University and American University and elsewhere that gathered outside the White House the night that bin Laden was killed, no one told them to go there. And they were children on 9-11. And all the kids that you know were celebrating in Times Square. So bin Laden had been this larger-than-life figure for good reason. He wasn't just some bogeyman that we made up. Or a figurehead. Uh, he, he was the tactical yeah. brain, strategic money, organizing. Yeah. Without bin Laden, there's no 9-11. It was his strategy. He recruited the right people. He didn't operationally command it, but he selected Mohammed Atta to be the lead hijacker. He and Allah Sheikh Mohammed and Mohammed Atta, three people decided on the three key targets, Pentagon, Trade Center, and U.S. Capitol. Joe Biden had opposed the bin Laden raid when on, I think it was the final meeting in the White House Situation Room, I think it was April 26, 2011, and Obama went round the room. And the two loudest voices and the voices that carried the most amount of weight on the negative side were Robert Gates, Secretary of Defense, who'd started working in Washington during the Lyndon Johnson administration, and Vice President Joe Biden, who'd become a senator when Obama was 12. Born during FDR's presidency. <laughs> right. And both of them, you know, Gates was deeply influenced by Operation Desert One. He was in the White House. He was the executive assistant to CIA Director Stansfield Turner at the time. He was in the White House when that whole thing blew up, Operation Desert One, the botched operation to rescue the 52 hostages in the U.S. Embassy. And Biden was very opposed because he thought it would it could be a firefight. He thought that A, could go wrong, that the intelligence wasn't good enough, that it would blow up our relations with the Pakistanis, and, uh, et cetera. So to his credit, he authorized this, this drone strike. I think he wanted to take a big victory lap. I think he very much over to use a British phrase, he over the pudding <laughs> uh, when he said that Zawahiri was involved in the planning of 9-11. And the Maybe MC they used uh, Lawrence Wright's book to write that speech. <laughs> I, I think there's some speechwriters just said, like, we're just going to exaggerate. <laughs> yeah. You know, just and Biden has a on this issue. He's also like 
so he opposed the bin Laden operation. And then you know, in later years, he would say, well, that he didn't. And in fact, he advised Obama just to do whatever. I mean, I, I feel like this has some important psychological role for him beyond just uh, a normal. Because when, you know, when Obama wrote his 900 page autobiography and he recounts the bin Laden operation, he could have easily said, you know, Joe came to me after that meeting and said, you know, go for it, Mr. President. And he never wrote that because it never happened. And not to pick on Lawrence Wright, The Looming Tower is an excellent book, despite that issue with the reporting that we've been discussing. But I learned a lot from that book, and I'll refer to it again, because I do want to talk a little bit more now about the history here. We can use this assassination as a moment to kind of reassess the last half century, where we are in the world of militant, violent Islam, this movement that really surged in the 1970s and succeeded, if you will, With the Islamic Revolution in Iran, there was ferment in neighboring Afghanistan at that same time. Where did al-Zawahiri receive his baptism? You said he joined a militant group when he was 15 years old. He he joined a jihadist group when he was 15. and That uh, was in Egypt, right? Yeah. Yeah, he got involved early on, and he was on the periphery of the group that killed Anwar Sadat. Then he was put in prison for three years. These prisons are full of Islamist militants, and he met everybody, and and then he went to Pakistan, and once he got out of prison, he met with bin Laden in 1986, and I think he did influence bin Laden about the near enemy regimes. I think he did influence him to some degree on the need to attack those regimes, but even there, you know, bin Laden, when he was living in Sudan, was sending faxes to London, which were getting published in the Arab language press, in which he was really attacking the Saudi regime for all sorts of corruption charges. And so even in in that instance, I think bin Laden had already gone down a certain path. And Zawahiri was influenced by a fellow Egyptian, Saeed Qutb, Q-U-T-B, Saeed Qutb. And from Lawrence Wright's book, Qutb visited the United States, I believe uh, 1940s, 1950s, somewhere around there. And yeah. when he returned to the Middle East, Wright says his central concern was modernity, modern values, secularism, rationality, democracy, subjectivity, individualism, mixing of the sexes, tolerance, materialism. He believed they had infected Islam through the agency of Western colonialism. I bring this up, Peter Bergen, because I'm trying to establish the milieu that shaped the ideas that entered Zawahiri and bin Laden's head during this really important time in history, as I mentioned, the 1970s. You know, that laundry list you just gave, yes. it, it, what's striking about it is how little that features in any of bin Laden's public statements, of which we have hundreds of thousands of words. That is true. Yeah, you know, in fact, in a way, that's buying into the Bush line that it was about our values. Bin Laden never talked about Western values and trying to attack them. He was always very clear that his critique of the United States was his support for the Saudi regime, which he thought was ruling in a corrupt manner, and its support for Israel, which he doesn't think should exist. And in fact, also, if you look at bin Laden's speeches, and there are, as I say, hundreds of thousands of words on the public record from his speeches, his public uh, appearances, the writings that he's made, he never mentions Qutub. And why is that? Well, see, Qutub is not a religious authority. Qutub was a a writer. He did not have formal religious training, and nor did bin Laden. And bin Laden was very cognizant of the fact, I think, that he didn't have formal religious training. So when he cites uh, an authority, it's somebody like Ibn Tamir, who was a a cleric in the 13th, 14th century Syria, plays a very important role in bin Laden's worldview. And Ibn Tamir is a real cleric. And there was a period when bin Laden would also cite radical clerics in Saudi Arabia who are currently alive, like uh, Salman al-Awda and Sheikh al-Awli. So Qutub is just a sideshow for bin Laden. Now, Mohammed Qutub, who's Saeed Qutub's brother, gave lectures at a university that bin Laden attended. And so he certainly would have heard those lectures and he certainly would have imbibed those ideas. But it's like the idea that Zawahiri was super influential on bin Laden. It might have been part of the the zeitgeist that bin Laden imbibed, but it's not his, he doesn't mention these ideas and he doesn't mention Qutub. 
That's interesting because it raises a question. Where do we place al-Qaeda in this larger fundamentalist Islamic movement that I mentioned swelled in the 1970s and has had a profound impact on world history over the past 50 years? It's a part of it, but it's also separate, if you know what I mean, given the fact that bin Laden wasn't influenced by some of these ideas. It'd be like saying, to what extent do the Oath Keepers represent right-wing movements in the United States? Well, they're a tiny slice of a much larger movement. Al-Qaeda is a tiny slice of that fundamentalist movement. There was something called the Sawa in the 70s. It was a religious awakening that a lot of people had. And you mentioned the Iranian revolution. Obviously, that was a Shia revolution. But there was also the Sawa infected the way people thought throughout the Sunni world. And, you know, it was basically a true fundamentalist in the sense it was like, let's get back to our roots, the fundamentals of Islam. Another way of looking at it is Salafism. Salaf are the the original followers of the Prophet. And Bin Laden certainly was influenced by all that and became a member of the Muslim Brotherhood when he was a teenager, it seems. But, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is is part of the government of countries like, is essentially the government in Turkey, part of the government in Jordan. It's not a terrorist organization. Tens of millions of people belong to it. And of course, at one point, it became the elected government of Egypt before that was overthrown in a military takeover. So the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, Zawahiri has written an entire book about how bad the Muslim Brotherhood is because (laughs) they engage in conventional politics, which Al Qaeda is completely opposed to elections, democracy, conventional politics. So the Muslim Brotherhood is a movement of tens of millions of people. The number of people in al-Qaeda today, a few hundred, and the number of people in the jihadist militant movement who actually might go out and conduct terrorist attacks, you know, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands, if you maybe kind of include the Taliban. And, you know, as a percentage of the 1.5 billion plus Muslims in the world, it's a fraction of 1%. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny percentage. And Turkey, of course, doesn't govern itself the way some of these groups call for governance either. There's a There's diversity within the Muslim world, although critics of Turkey would say it's becoming more and more uh, religiously disposed. Not to digress about Turkey. Well, Erdogan has stripped away. I mean, he's arrested hundreds of thousands of people. Now, a lot of that was in the context of, of a military coup against him. But I mean, he's closed down any kind of vestiges of an independent press. He's becoming a very authoritarian figure. And he's clearly a sort of Muslim Brotherhood type figure. Yeah. So about Zawahiri, your last answer made me wonder. So what was his contribution? Some people are ideas men. Some are clergy. Others are real good tactical operators. Some are money men. (laughs) Yeah. Well, look, actually, I wanted to correct something I got slightly wrong earlier, which is when bin Laden first meets Zawahiri in 86, I think bin Laden is sort of enthralled by him. This guy just spent three years in Egyptian prison. He's a real jihadist militant. At this stage, bin Laden hadn't turned against the Saudi regime. I think Zawahiri was instrumental in the mid-80s in getting bin Laden to start thinking seriously about regime change in the Middle East to get rid of the, the secular dictatorships and the absolute monarchies. But over time, I think the positions shifted. By the mid-90s, bin Laden's been fighting battles in Afghanistan. He's been trying to kill Americans in Somalia in 93 and trying to kill American servicemen in Yemen in 92. He's got the first beginnings of the idea of 9-11. He's been planning the attacks against the U.S. embassies in, in Africa from 1993. They took place five years later. And so their position shifted. Bin Laden really was became the strategist. Bin Laden also became the operations guy, and he also was the money guy. And Zawahiri was just sort of along for the ride. Steve Call in Ghost Wars, page 26, talking about the 1970s. He refers to Jamaat-e-Islami, a Pakistani party. He said such parties had begun to assert themselves across the Muslim world as the corrupt, failing reigns of leftist Arab nationalists led youthful populations to seek a new cleansing politics. Clandestine, informal, transnational religious networks such as the Muslim Brotherhood, who you refer to, reinforce the gathering strength of old-line religious parties. Has the sun set on this movement? Is Islamic fundamentalism a spent force globally, other than in Iran, where, of course, the mullahs still rule? I mean, I very much doubt it. I mean, I think it just depends which country we're in. And we just talked about Turkey. 
I mean, Erdogan is he is trying to bring Turkey into a more of an Islamist authoritarian sphere. Obviously, the Taliban just took over Afghanistan, so that's 40 million people they control. The mullahs in Iran have been around since 1979, and they're, they're not going anywhere fast, it seems. Um, that's a good point. It depends on where you look, because obviously in Saudi Arabia, that is not the case. Yeah, and Mohammed bin Salman, who there are plenty of things to criticize for, he, on the other hand, has put the religious police back in their barracks, allowed women to drive. I think he'd recognize Israel tomorrow if his father were dead. Um, we're working with Israel against Iran. So, Yeah, allowing Israel to use this airspace for commercial overflights, etc. So it, it would be like saying, is Christian fundamentalism dead? I mean, in places, fewer people in the United States identify in believing any religion today than at any time that this question has been asked. On the other hand, Christian fundamentalism in the United States remains pretty strong. Yes. Well, the, idea, and, the ideas live on. It's a question of whether they can achieve political power. The, the Al-Qaeda model of and Zawahiri's model of trying to incite a coup or none of that worked. I was going to ask, we can look back on this period now and ask the question with Al-Qaeda's top people all dead and the organization, well, from my vantage point, you're the expert here, seemingly in disarray. You know, yeah. what's, what is its status? Let me cite one more author for you, a fellow by the name of Peter Bergen, Writing in The Longest War, page 300, is Al-Qaeda, and this book came out in 2011, I should note that first. You wrote, is Al-Qaeda going to dissipate as a result of the rising tide of criticism it faces in the Muslim world? Not in the short term, you wrote, though losing the favor of Muslim populations certainly doesn't help Al-Qaeda. History shows that small violent groups from the anarchists of the early 20th century to the leftist terrorists of the 1970s can sustain their bloody work for years with virtually no public support. You still agree with uh, what you wrote? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, so the Bader Meinhof gang, the Brigadi Rossi, the Weather Underground, you know, I mean, they did a fair amount of damage in Western countries, but like their ideas just died. Their ideas died of their own badness. I think the jihadist groups are going to survive longer because they have God as part of their message, and it's hard to abolish God. You know, with the Marxist groups like Bader Meinhof, Brigadi Rossi, Weather Underground, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union really undercut the message that Marxism was an answer to the world's problems. So now we're in this cycle. You know, there's a political scientist called David Rappaport at UCLA. He's After 9-11, he, sh he said there'd been four waves of terrorism. The anarchist wave, President McKinley was killed by an anarchist. That burned itself out. Then there was the colonial wave of the Algerian FLN in, in Algeria against the French. In 1954 uh, to 1962, that war. Yep. And then the Ergun, the Jewish terrorists that basically pushed the British out of Palestine. And that wave actually achieved its goals. So instead of burning itself out, it achieved its goals. And suddenly the Ergun are members of the government in Israel. And then the third wave was the Marxist wave which burned itself out because its ideas weren't, people weren't interested in its ideas ultimately. And then the religious wave, and we're still in the religious wave. And I think that wave will be the longest wave. Rappaport said these waves tended to last about 30 years. Now, so if we start this wave in 79 with the overthrow of the Shah of Iran by Ayatollah Khomeini, we're a lot further than 30 years. And I, I, so I think this will continue. And obviously the Taliban victory and Afghanistan gives some energy to the movement. But in the long term, the prognosis for these groups is not good. They're very small, relatively speaking. Their ideas are not particularly popular in the Muslim world. They're not really offering a positive vision. Well, there's no sustainability uh, either if your only plan is violence. Right? Nazism had the same problem. It consumed itself. Well, and Nazism had a plan that went beyond simple violence. That's true. Um, but I would say that one of the other problems about Nazism, and it's really the, it's what I would call the Napoleon problem, which is you don't want a world of enemies. I mean, Napoleon yes, created a world of enemies. There wasn't a country in Europe that wasn't threatened by him and didn't eventually join this coalition against him. Hitler had sort of the same problem. And I think groups like ISIS did exactly the same thing. So when ISIS came in, they killed every ethnic group or a sectarian group that they disagreed with. 
and then they killed Americans. And so they created an international coalition against them and, an, and a coalition of Iraqis against them. And that put them out of business. So it's not smart to make a world of enemies. Since I started this digression, I'll offer one more point about this, <laughs> about fascism. I had Roger Griffin on the podcast a few weeks ago and about Nazism in particular. There was no such thing as peaceful coexistence. Uh, human no. life, society, the world was a competition where the strong must defeat the weak. Combine Hitler's plans for territorial aggrandizement with that worldview. You know, eventually you're going to destroy everyone or be destroyed. Right. Uh, we were talking before about some of the ideas that bind all these Islamist groups or parties together. One thing I didn't mention was the idea of restoring Islam to its pure state. I mean, this is something that Qutb discussed in his writings. It's something that I believe bin Laden believed in, maybe even the yeah. mullahs in, in Iran. I'm not sure anyone has accomplished this goal. What would it look like in the 21st century? I mean, that's that was the original Taliban, the 1990 version Taliban's idea of running the world. Raises the question, what have they accomplished other than killing a lot of people? Referring to al-Qaeda here. This is more of a word salad than a question, Peter. I'm sorry. Yeah. But maybe their biggest failure was how they alienated Muslims. Yeah. And in fact, interestingly, you know, the documents that were found in bin Laden's compound by the Navy SEALs and were released in full in 2017 by the CIA. Bin Laden was aware that this was really a problem. He was planning to issue some kind of apologia precisely on this issue that Al-Qaeda who you know, had killed civilians and that was a problem because if they presented themselves as a group defending Muslim civilians, how was it that groups like Al-Qaeda in Iraq had killed so many Iraqi civilians or the Pakistani Taliban had killed so many Pakistani civilians? And in fact, also bin Laden was writing to some of these groups, to al-Shabaab in Somalia, advising them not to kill civilians. So over time, bin Laden began to realize that this was very much damaging to al-Qaeda and his movement. When was the height of al-Qaeda's popularity in the Muslim world, if it was ever really popular? Well, I mean, I think if you look at polling data, I mean, after 9-11, bin Laden was celebrated in many parts of the Muslim world as sort of a Robin Hood figure and not by any means saying that the whole Muslim world was behind him. There's plenty of polling data out there that suggested yeah. that he had relatively high levels of popularity in places like Pakistan. And that over time, that sort of eroded because of all the Muslims who were killed, Al Qaeda yeah. or groups like it or groups allied to it started killing Muslims. And so the war came home to these countries. The Pakistani Taliban killed tens of thousands of Pakistani civilians and army soldiers. And so the, the shine sort of came off those, those sets of ideas. Back to present day. Are drone strikes the way to deal with this problem? You'll recall the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning investigative work on how many civilians have been killed by errant drone strikes, airstrikes, talking about U.S. military strikes. This reporting came out, I think it was just this year, or was it the yeah, year before? Yeah, it actually was written by Asma Khan. Yeah, and, great journalist. Uh, yeah. She was the main writer. She's a New America former fellow where I work. Oh, okay. Asma has been doing amazing work on this for a long yeah. time. So is Anand Gopal, another New America fellow who she collaborated with. Yeah, those uh, articles were amazing. And, and I guess my question is, we can't just say, well, look, this drone strike killed no civilians and we got Zawahiri, when thousands of people who had nothing to do with terrorism have been incinerated by the U.S. military. Oops, it was an accident. Well, that doesn't really fly with the people who are on the other receiving end. Well, I'm going to give you a, a both sides answer, unfortunately. <laughs> That's right. So the best witness for the effectiveness of the drone program is Osama bin Laden. Because if you look at the about about documents, he was very cognizant of the fact that the drone program was basically ripping apart the middle management and upper management of his organization. So much so that he was thinking of moving Al Qaeda from the border regions in Afghanistan, Pakistan, either back into Afghanistan or deeper into Pakistan. And so, yeah, it was highly effective and providing it doesn't kill civilians and often these attacks don't. And by the way, I'd make a distinction. So the CIA drone program is the drone program that has been used against Al Qaeda. A lot of what Asmat Khan and Anand were reporting oil on US military airstrikes in general. That's right, yes. So those are not necessarily drone strikes. Those Often those are other kinds of strikes. Yeah, you're calling in airstrikes. Sometimes in the heat of battle, the fog of war, you're not quite sure who you're targeting. 
And so New America, where I work, you know, we've been cracking drone strikes for a long time, really since the beginning of the program in earnest in 2009. The rate of civilian casualties in these strikes, which are carried out in Pakistan by the CIA, and typically were carried out by the CIA in countries like Yemen, in countries like Somalia. Over time, those have migrated into the U.S. military, which is good on some levels because the U.S. military is actually more transparent and more accountable than the CIA is about these strikes. And they do sometimes kill civilians, but the civilian casualty rate has dropped markedly over time for all sorts of reasons. Scrutiny by organizations like us play a role, a small role. Uh, scrutiny by the media plays a big, bigger role. Scrutiny by Congress plays an even bigger role. Intelligence, I think, has got better over time. Drones have become, they can loiter over the target for longer. Their payloads are smaller. And so you look at the Zawahiri strike. I mean, if you take at face value what the president and his team said, I don't think there's any reason to disbelieve what they said. They sent a drone into a building where his family was living and they killed only him, and which is kind of fairly astonishing given he's on the third floor of a building. They didn't collapse the building. So I think that shows that these strikes can be quite discriminatory. But at the same time, they're arguing the other side of the case. In Pakistan, you know, it was Obama who really amped up the drone program in Pakistan. There were, I think there were 122 strikes in 2010 in Pakistan, and they were very unpopular. Not necessarily because they were killing civilians. They weren't killing that many civilians, even though the Pakistani press and the military would sometimes say that. It was really more about sovereignty. I mean, where are you sitting right now? I am sitting in a comfortable studio in Washington, D.C. Okay, let's do the thought experiment where the area that you're sitting in was completely infiltrated by heavily armed drug dealers. And Mexico took it upon itself to have a drone program that was pretty successful in taking out all those armed drug dealers around where you're sitting and maybe killed one or two civilians as well. Well, the outrage would not Obviously, civilian casualties would be part of it. But the real outrage is we're a sovereign nation. We didn't ask you to do this. You know, the Pakistani parliament, for instance, voted against any kind of understanding with the United States that they could do this drone program. And, you know, we just sort of continued. So the counter argument is also about fermenting anti-American opinion in the countries that you're doing this in. Unless you're doing it in a very well-managed, thoughtful, surgical and infrequent way, it can be sort of counterproductive. Well, I think it has been counterproductive, and I do oppose this. It's not because I like people like Ayman al-Zawahiri. For the reasons you just stated, it's a violation of the country's sovereignty, and it allows this war on terrorism to go on forever without Congress really having to really say too much about it. It just It's kind of on autopilot, no, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great pun. Yeah, I mean, you know, the authorization for the use of military force, the AUMF, was voted uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, 22 years ago. Yes. Now, or 21 years ago. This is absurd and it, stuff. You know, and occasionally some congressmen or senators try and put a forward a motion to revoke it, and it just it won't happen, not anytime soon. So the, the key question I've been waiting to ask you, because I know we disagreed about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, some of the supporters of the withdrawal say the drone strike on Zawahiri shows we don't have to have the army in Afghanistan to have effective counterterrorism operations. Maybe that's more of a political statement than it is a, a counterterrorism one. What do you think of that? I mean, Zawahiri, he wouldn't have been in downtown Kabul if we, we were still there. A year later, Biden's decision doesn't look any better. It looks worse, I think, because the Taliban have just reverted to what they always were. But they did uh, win the war, so... They won the war because we gave them the negotiating table, what they could never win on the battlefield, which is we gave them everything they wanted. Well, I Um, I don't want to say it's their country as in they're a popular group there, but this is Afghanistan. And after 20 years, now let's remember, for years prior to the Trump administration reaching this final deal, right, there was a lot of combat in Afghanistan. The Afghan army fought bravely and lost tens of thousands of casualties with U.S. air support. So, yes, the the effort collapsed once it became obvious that we were leaving and the Afghan army did not want to continue to fight for what would be a losing cause, right? You can disagree with the way I'm framing this. But, I I mean, we tried. (laughs) It didn't work. Well, you know, the the point is, I mean, 
there were 2,500 American troops in Afghanistan. We have 2 million Americans in the armed services, in the uh, uniform military, the, the reserves, the National Guard. So I'm not a math guy, but 2,500 as a percentage of 2 million is 0.01% or something. It's tiny. Yeah, still very and, costly endeavor, though. Well, they've become much and much less costly. And, you know, there hadn't been any American combat deaths, I think, for 18 months. And it was definitely costing tens of billions of dollars a year. But other presidents had basically had the same discussion. President Obama debated what to do in Afghanistan in the end. And he wanted to go to zero. In the end, he left 8,400 troops. Trump always wanted to get out in the end. He left 2,500 troops. Well, now uh, we pulled out and the entire country is taken over by the Taliban. Every jihadist group in the world is there. And two or three years down the road, I think we're going to regret that decision more than we just regret it already. Andrew Basevich, who yeah. you're aware is a non-interventionist, a great historian. He's been on the show several times. He was against the war, but he did write in a commentary just recently that we won't really know for sure for years. So maybe everyone drawing conclusions now, it's too early. Well, I don't think he's wrong about that. Yeah. He said maybe 20 years from now, we won't know whether it well, was Well, right I'd say five. You five. could make a, yeah, because it, look, it took Al Qaeda five years to kind of get together the 9 11 plan, having arrived in Afghanistan in 96. I think that would be a, a reasonable timeline to think about their capabilities. It took them three years to organize the embassy attacks from Afghanistan, that they had actually started planning that in Sudan already. So, yeah, I think five years from now. And of course, the Biden administration is very big on talking about how we're supporting democracy in Ukraine and blah, blah, blah. Well, population of Ukraine, 40 million. Population of Afghanistan, 40 million. Afghanistan was an imperfect democracy, a semi-functional central Asian state, and now it's a theocracy. And I think it was just an unforced error to pull out. Final question, Peter Bergen, and thank you for being so generous with your time here. Do you think it's possible, and of course, you know, only fools try to predict the future, but do you think it's possible that the United States at some point might secretly start funding, assisting an opposition group to try to take out the Taliban again? Because right now there doesn't seem to be much resistance. Well, that's a good question. I'm, I've just been talking to one of the officials in that resistance group, and he is saying they're getting no outside support no weapons, no outside financial support, that they are fighting in six provinces in the north. They're led by Ahmed Massoud, who is the son of Ahmed Shah Massoud, the sort of legendary commander. The Lion of Panjir. Yeah, who fought the Taliban before 9-11. The consensus is the resistance is very weak. But, you know, the Taliban have a way of building up antibodies because the Pashtuns, which make up the 95% of the Taliban leadership or 97%, you know, let's say 40% of the population, they're the largest ethnic group, but they're not a plurality. And then you exclude all the Tajiks, all the Hazaras, and all the Uzbeks, which is the other 60% of the population. You exclude pretty much every woman. You exclude pretty much anybody who's kind of been educated in a city. You kind of exclude all those people from a hopeful future. You're going to build up antibodies. And so I think that if you look five to years down the road, there's going to be a different situation. There's going to be more of a resistance. The Taliban will probably make some mistakes. Like they may allow, they're already making mistakes. They, you know, they're housing Ayman al Zawari. They're housing the Pakistani Taliban, which is attacking the Pakistani state. They're housing these Tajiki Islamist groups who are trying to attack the Tajik state. So I think that they're going to wear out. They don't really have a welcome no. to wear out because no <laughs> other countries recognize them. But I think that. And they're facing mass starvation and state collapse, possibly. Well, that's also true. And you look at President Obama nominated Vice President Joe Biden and his na then National Security Advisor, Tony Blinken, to pull out from Iraq at the end of 2011, which happened. Three years later, ISIS is threatening to commit ethnic genocide on the Yazidis. ISIS murders American journalist Jim Foley, and things change, and suddenly you know, Obama is authorizing significant numbers of special operations forces to go in to train the Iraqi army. They train up the very effective Iraqi counterterrorism service, which is essential to the war against ISIS. And we still have 2,500 troops in Iraq. And this is where I really would disagree with the idea that it was a brilliant idea to pull out. 
you know, in Iraq, there's much more opposition to the U.S. presence in Iraq than there was in Afghanistan from the political parties, the Shia political parties. And what we did, what the United States did was, I think, pretty clever. We just sort of said, well, they're there, but they're not combat troops. And it sort of just dissipated this issue. And so the 2,500 troops we had in Afghanistan weren't in combat anyway. And we just could have just relabeled them. Biden could have truthfully said the Taliban were not holding up their end of the peace agreement. They hadn't split with al-Qaeda. They hadn't in, ended it into good faith negotiations with the Afghan elected government. And he said, look, we'll keep this small advise and assist mission. There was a million ways he could have not made this decision. And he said he made this decision. I thought it was a bad policy decision. It was terribly executed. And we just sort of abandoned a lot of people who helped us out when we were there. Well, that is true. And that is a shame. But had we stayed, that raises the question, how many more years would it have taken to defeat the Taliban? Well, we're still in South Korea 75 years after the end of the war with North Korea. And we're there with 25,000 troops. And we're there for good reason, which is to prevent North Korea from taking over South Korea. Um, and These, during, that, go ahead. during that 75 years time period, South Korea, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, is now one of the richest. And you know, Afghanistan is not Korea, I agree. Yeah. But the point is, is that we have had successful missions and we're there, but we were there at the invitation of the Afghan government, let's be clear. And they were the elected Afghan government. I mean, I don't know how legitimate uh, they were uh, well, compared to the Taliban, maybe. Compared to the Taliban, they're literally orders of magnitude more legitimate. The Taliban has never put itself up for election to be dog catcher anywhere no. and conveniently doesn't believe in elections because that's, you know, they're against Islam. Democracy is not an Islamic form, et cetera, et cetera, according to them. So, you know, we don't know. It's not the first time that I, the United States has walked away from Afghanistan. In 1989, we closed our embassy after we played a key role in helping to defeat the Soviets by arming the Afghan resistance, including Ahmad Shah Massoud, the father of Ahmad Massoud, who's now leading the anti-Taliban resistance. So mm -hmm. things can change. The West abandoned Afghanistan in the early 1990s despite promises to the contrary. But there are other ways to engage with a country or a region other than through military. Well, I was going to say military occupation. I know you don't agree with the use of that word. Military presence. Yeah. Look, I mean, the U.S. has, has a military presence in like 100 countries of various yes. kinds, right? And we have a, advise and assist missions with many, many dozens of countries. And it's sort of a non-controversial. I mean, here's an example. Why are the Ukrainian special forces performing so well? Because of U.S. training and hardware. Because of NATO training. Yes, NATO. Uh, that, that's been, been going on for years. A cooperative relationship, even though Ukraine is not in NATO, it had a partnership with NATO. Yeah. There are lots of different ways to be involved in supporting countries that we're allied with because they share their democracies or quasi-democracies. Or well, You know this, though. Those, those are very different situations. In this case, Russia, a war of uh, aggression invading Ukraine, the Russian presence will never be seen as legitimate. Just like the U.S. presence in these Muslim countries will never be seen as legitimate. At least that's my view. I often sound like a hippie lately, Peter, with my anti-interventionist. <laughs> in my opinion, the only number of U.S. troops in the Middle East, the correct number, is zero. Your ideas challenge me on that. You give me pause so well, I don't, so me, I don't sound like you, a hippie. I, let me give you another example. Sure. I mean, look, I, I completely agree with you if we invade a country on specious grounds or and then remain there in particular without the acquiescence of an invitation of the elected government. But I mean, we're in lots of countries in the Middle East, Qatar, which I think is in many ways are the country most aligned with us in the Gulf, which the Trump administration didn't share that view because of ignorance, I think. But, you know, we have 10,000 men and women at Ube Air Force Base in, in Qatar, which plays a, played a vital role in the war against ISIS. And played a vital war, uh, role in the war against the Taliban. And our presence there is, I think, widely welcomed by the Qataris. Similarly, in, in Afghanistan, Asia Foundation did a yearly polling that's regarded as being pretty authoritative. And certainly, the Taliban tended to get like a 10 to 15% approval rate. And international forces got a much higher approval rate because many of the Afghans had sort of lived through the Taliban and we're pretty suspicious of their claims that they were going to create this utopia on Earth. Anyway, we're unlikely to settle this question, I can tell. Yes. Uh, on this. <laughs> uh, sometimes there are no good outcomes. We can discuss them for the well, sake of... I, I would say, I mean, I'm a big believer in least bad outcomes. 
I mean, I don't believe that there are perfect outcomes at all anywhere, but there are at least bad outcomes. And I think that in 2021 in Afghanistan, one thing that's important to remember, it wasn't just the 2,500 American troops. We had 9,000 Allied troops with us. Yes, and all the, those, the hardware for the air, the aircraft, the repairs, right? Well, those were the contractors, and there were yeah. 15,000 contractors. So, But we had 9,000 Allied troops, mostly NATO. We were also doing kind of advise and assist. 41 nations had been part of the coalition in, in Afghanistan. This was a widely seen as a legitimate war, the UN shortly after 9-11, passed a resolution saying the United States could re respond by any means necessary. Congress passed a vote with only one dissenting voice. It was Barbara Lee of California. NATO invoked Article 5 for the first and only time. So this was a war that had a certain legitimacy. But, you know, there were lots of things that went wrong. I don't want to pretend that. I mean, and I, I'm glad that we're going to have this Afghanistan commission that's been stood up with you know a bunch of fairly impressive folks that have served in one way or another, and it's been funded by Congress, it's independent. There are a ton of things we could have done a million times better that contributed to the where we got. 20 years, that's a long time. You know, the costs of war project at Brown University really opened my eyes when they estimate what the war on terror cost in terms of lives lost, refugee flows, which of course upended the politics of Europe, but also the cost to American taxpayers. When all is said and done and all the veteran care is accounted for in the coming decades, their estimate is that the war on terror will have cost $8 trillion. So there has to be a better way of managing the problem of international jihadism than that. Well, I don't disagree with, with a lot of that, but I would caveat something very, very important. So we talk about all the money we spent on these wars, we, the United States. Well, guess who we spent the money on? We spent the money on ourselves. Almost all that money that you described were paid U.S. military salaries, of course, mm -hmm. U.S. contractors. There's a narrative that we sort of blew all this money, went out the window. Well, if you go back on 9-11, I, I, and I need to check this fact a little bit, but on 9-11, I think one or two of the richest counties in the United States were in the Washington, D.C. area. 20 years later, five or six of the richest counties in the United States are in the Washington, D.C. area. Why is that? Well, the military because contractors that are here, right? Wars are incredibly good for Washington. Um, and so so a lot of that money wasn't, you know. I'm glad it, to hear it's good for someone. <laughs> well, a lot of that money was spent on ourselves. I just think that's worth recalling because I think people hear these numbers and think, wow, all that money went away. Well, actually, <laughs> most of it just re got redirected to various Americans in various different kind of capacities. Billions did go up in smoke in Iraq, though. I mean, there was a well, story of. Well, there was, there was a lot of corruption. Yeah. Uh, Many billions disappeared, totally unaccounted for in Iraq. A lot of mismanagement. But, you know, by the way, um, this is apples and oranges, but tens of billions of dollars disappeared during the PPP program. Well, that is true, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no so one like, died, though. No one got blown <laughs> up. <laughs> the point is, when the U.S. government spends a lot of money, it's usually some of it's going to disappear in ways that aren't that smart. Peter Bergen, the author of The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, as well as the Longest War, the Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda. The Bin Laden bio published last year, The Longest War published 10 years ago. I recommend both to our Thank listeners. You. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Martin. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to keep our focus on Afghanistan. But this time, we're going to talk about the Taliban, where they're from, and where they may be taking their country. What is their ideology? Who is their supreme leader? We're going to speak to Andrew Watkins, an expert on the Taliban at the U.S. Institute of Peace. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.